we are Myth Vision and Nasty Horn. I always wanted to do that, dude. Thank That's you. the greatest intro I've ever seen, dude. That's I'd never get rid of that intro. It that doesn't get old. I love it. So, well, I've had a lot of uh, critics go, that's so corny, that's cheesy. What? Oh, oh, they don't know what they're talking about, dude. That's yeah. the best, best intro of all time. It's so, it's so, it like, it like gets everyone to shut up. Like, we, everyone just stops. What is you about to say? What's about to happen? What? Vision. Vision. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm finally glad to meet you, man. And um, we have a similar background. We both are around the same age, and we grew up in the era, the Oxycontin, Lord Tab era, and we were just kids in high school thinking, oh, they're just pills. They, they prescribe them to our grandmother and stuff. We can t-. And our generation saw a lot of people get screwed up on that. I was one of them. You said you were one of them. I wouldn't just say that. Oh, yeah, no, you, no, no. You, you're very open know. about that. But, um, yeah, so so have I. And. I felt I feel like we could have a discussion about how people like us can be susceptible to ideologies like like being a fundamentalist, anything, fill in the blank, Christian. Both of us are Christians. Um, so yeah, I, 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 we could get into that. I'll I'll yeah. start off. I'll just say here, I'll give him my story. Um, I was got real bad, dude. Started off with the pills, got, you know. Progress of the oxy, the same story you hear with everybody, and then it ends up with the heroin. I got caught with a bunch of stuff. It doesn't matter what it was. The, the bottom line is, I ended up in prison in New York State. One to three to four years was the bid. You had 18 months out of that. While I was in there, I picked up the Bible. <laughs> and I kid you not, I read the entire thing from front to back while I was there. So I, <laughs> I'm not even joking. Front, you know, every oh, word. Me and every, you, bro. Me and you both. Go ahead. Every word, dude, and I was like, "This is this is all true. Every word of this is true." Yes. And I didn't have internet in there to check, but like, it just it got me. It it, right. and and I was also doing the NAAA thing, so that kind of both worlds collided. Because in I don't know if you, people don't know about the twelve step program, you got to find a higher power. Yeah, got to find a power great. You can't do it without a power. Make up your own power of great. It could be a tree yeah. if you want it to be, yeah. which is pretty funny. Right, but um, it needs to be a power greater than yourself. And so right. when we talked about the doorknob, everyone said, no, the doorknob's not a higher. Come on, that's if that'll keep you sober, sure, but a doorknob's not greater power than you or the light bulb, whatever. They always have some explanation. What they're trying to do is they're trying to say God. And uh, th- then they have an entire chapter denoted in Alcoholics Anonymous to the agnostic, which is particularly right. taking – 1930s cosmology yes. and, and the ideas of the universe where we still have huge question marks, which we've discovered a lot more since then, and said, here's the evidence, proof that there's something. So they don't want to put a name on it. They don't want to call it Allah. They don't want to call it Yahweh. They don't want to call it Jesus. They want to say, whatever name, but you can go ahead and rest assured something created us, and that is a power greater than yourself. And um, this works for many people, and it does. But when you ask the question initially, like, what makes us susceptible? Right. Well, when a normal, I'm going to use normies, when normal people look at us and they go, what the hell, man? You've ruined your life. Like, you're pawning (laughs) your stuff. You're, for some people, I never got this low, but some people sell their ass, you know? There are people who do things to get drugs that you know and I know would never have ever done them. They're not bad people. I had some really good friends in high school Come to find out they were doing pornography in California. And I'm like, dude, you know, how are the girls, you know, talk. I'm in 11th grade. So I'm like, tell me the detail, you know? And they're like, bro, it's, it's a job. Right, right. Come to find out a, a video got leaked. And it was a video I wish I never saw. I mean, it was some, <laughs> like, bro, I've never seen it. And these guys got paid like five grand for shit. You couldn't pay me five grand to do. Hey, man. And, uh, That's what it is. Yeah, but they, we go to the extreme. Right. That's what I was trying to get at is that. My addiction just transferred from the drug to Christianity. So now I'm at this church. I'm at this Baptist <laughs> evangelical. They called. They said we're not a denomination. We're just we're the we're, we're the real Christianity. But really, but really, it's your it's your everyday American Trump loving right wing Republican church. You know, everyone knows about it. The, the people that have the signs with God hates bags and all that. Those are the people that I was around. I'm not even joking. They actually had those signs. Anyways, I was like. I know my religion is true because look what it did for me. And I know it's true 
So I'm going to show the world how true it is. I'm going to, I'm going to study and I'm going to show everybody that I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to write a book about it. I'm going to be like the next guy who wrote a uh, case for Christ. I'm going to be the next Lee Strobel. Watch me. Yeah. And that, and then I, the only thing I had going for me is I really was looking for truth. Right. And because of that, I studied my way out of Christianity. Yep. I discovered like people like Dr. Price, uh, even Bart Ehrman, who is like, you know, a history, historicist. Yep. He was, he, he showed me the King James Bible is not perfect, dude. There's problems with it. Like, yeah. he, like every, every scholar that I went to gave me a piece of the puzzle that was able to give me some like, okay, this is just like every other religion. So for me, I came from a non-denominational cult church with a woman pastor. We spoke in tongues and cast out demons. We were King James only. <laughs> King and James only. Yeah. yeah. I was a KJV guy. And in fact, the first Bible I ever read, I was flunking 12th grade, the first semester of 12th grade, first or last. I can't remember either way. I pulled myself out because I was flunking so bad, skipping school, smoking pot right. to go see what is my still my wife, right? Like nice. she's my girlfriend at the time though, you know, like I'm like, uh, yeah. We go get laid and smoke and stick in a pool. <laughs> and I got her pregnant. And here I am failing school and I have to at least get my high school diploma. So I pull myself out and I get like my mind right with God. You know, I'm doing the right thing. And I come back to school and I'm reading the King James Bible. And literally that last semester I read from Genesis to Revelation. Yep. And when I got to the New Testament, it does not even sound or even feel the same when you're reading it. It doesn't even right. feel the same. It feels like a totally different book. I It's... I actually like the, I was always an Old Testament lo lover. I was always like, the new is pretty cool, but the old is just, oh, Jacob, the, the, these fighting angels and all this cool stuff, like Noah and the art. I love it. Yeah. But I mean, I still certain... do. I still do, but I just, too. I have a different view on it now. You know what I mean? It's, I see it. It's just, it's, it's just a, a narrative though. There's, there's a ton of narratives that are beautiful, that are cool. Of course, you would never want to live by that shit. Like, no one's running around saying, go and murder these people in the name of God. I, I mean, what I'm saying is, is we wouldn't want that, but we right. still love the narratives. There's really cool stories in these, just like I would look at the Greco-Roman myths and see the, the stories with Zeus, but then you find out Zeus comes down and rapes a girl. And you're like, do I hate Greco mythology because Zeus is a child molester or he likes right. chicks or something? No, I, I like Greek mythology. And in fact, that doesn't even deter me from it. I just know I would never want to live and be like Zeus, you know, like, but, um, it's just interesting. Um, what you said though, going from that to leaving Christianity for me, I was big into apologetics for many years as I was like going through the addiction phase and I'd get right with God and I'd get back on alcohol or I'd get back on drugs, whether I was shrooming and rolling on ecstasy when ecstasy was actually a thing for a, a while there. And now it's all, what is the white powder crap they have now that's it's floating around? It's not X, but they call it. Um, it's a good thing I don't know that because. Yeah. That's how, yeah, how far removed. It. It's been I years, mean, man. I've been far removed from that. You know what I mean? Well, but, you know, I have my recovery channel. So oh, I of course. No, I probably heard of it. I just can't think of it right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can't I can't think of it. But either way, it used to be the X pills, all that. I just want people. Oh, to Molly. Know Molly. Molly. Yeah, Molly. That's well, maybe I do know this shit. <laughs> we didn't have Molly. You know, we, I mean, they call it Molly now, but we had yeah. X pills. Right. That's, that was my, yeah, we're the same age. So we know with stamps and all that good stuff. Yeah. And anyway, I I'd go through phases of addiction to drugs or alcohol and then back to uh, religion. And I've got a box. I'm not even going to get it, but I've got a box over there full of Ravi Zacharias DVDs, CDs, yeah. William yeah. Lane Craig DVDs, CDs. Lee Strobel, I've got his books, the, the yeah. real case for the, or the case for the real Christ and right. the case for Christ. I have um, all those books too. The case for creator. Huh? I have all those books too. All the like popular yeah. Christian, you know, pop Christian books and ideas, but then also the apologists that I took serious. Yeah. And I, I even like James White, but I wasn't a Calvinist yet. You know, all these things. All within the Christian worldview. Yeah. You know, you know who not to listen to. You already know when you hear, oh, that guy's not a Christian. Right, right. Like William, William Lane Craig, we used to laugh at him. He ain't no Christian. He doesn't believe in Genesis. He thinks the Big Bang really happened. Uh, yeah, yeah we, we like we don't talk, don't listen to him. Like he's not real. He's just a oh, all scholars. We this is what my pastor would say. All scholars are scribes. Like they mentioned it in Matt, or I think it's Matthew when they talk. Beware the scribes. He would say, you know that word scribe starts with sc scholar, scribe. 
they're all the same. And I would be, I would believe everything he said because it was just like that's yeah. the mode I was in. So we, well, it was like that's how my church was. Don't listen to scholars. Exactly. And all you know, liars. I got confused when I'd hear William Lane Craig try to argue their universe is fourteen point six billion years old, and I'd be like, "What the hell is he talking about?" Right, right, right. You know, I'm, I'm like, this doesn't even sound right. And and I'm glad guys like him exist because he doesn't even realize how much work he's doing on actually helping people get away from start it. to wake up. Yeah. It, yeah. And You're actually I, absolutely right about that. All of those guys that were in the bubble of what I would call trustworthiness to some extent, like your, your church might have gone, don't listen to him on Genesis. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But his case against this guy on the resurrection, you can listen to him on that yep. and respect what he said against Absolutely. that atheist because William Lane Craig's on to something about the resurrection there. It's oh, okay. Only, it's only what they won't, they agreed with. Yeah. They would just pick it, it apart. Yeah. And, and, but when you do that after a while, you have all this information within this matrix of the Christian world. Right. And then what happens? Next thing you know, you, you hear something at a point in your life. I don't know how to describe this for people who are, who are watching this. And I hope you're seeing this going, man, that was me. You maybe can share your story in the comment section. I, I, I want to see what you guys say. But at some point, at some point in your life, when either you're going through something or you're just at that right stage where you're able to hear something, a little bit of doubt comes in because you start to go, I can actually ask that question. I was not really able to internalize that question. I've heard it a hundred times. I scoffed it. I mocked it. I said, no, it can't be true because I believe. And then one day for me, you're going to laugh, but you're, you're probably going to whole shit me too. Um, it was zeitgeist. Oh it my was God, it was. That's zeitgeist. what happened. That's what happened. Okay. So I, even though it may not be factual about everything in their Horus, there's some problems with their connections on Horus, right? Someone, Someone showed me zeitgeist and I looked it up and I saw all these apologists being like, oh, Horus isn't this, Horus. So I went right with that right away. I clung right back to that. But the seed was planted. Now I'm yes, thinking okay. about astrotheology. But I knew, I was listening to all the apologists saying, <laughs> Oh, Horace wasn't born on 25th. Oh, this that's not true. This uh, this is uh, this movie's a lie. I was like, okay, that I believe you guys. It's a lie. And he, they're actually right about a lot of stuff. Yeah, in that. they are. But it didn't matter because he planted a little seed in my head. Yeah. What it that's does, all it took. It, it's a psychological thing. And what it did for me was simply say, you have put this man you called Jesus, you've on this pedestal. And what if the man that you picture as God with all these powers? doesn't exist at all and it's really an ancient way through agricultural type of stuff astrological stuff what if this is simply another dying and rising god motif as these other gods and who and you know the question i asked myself as i said derek how could you deny everyone else and act like you got it right, right. and how arrogant all this time i thought i'm chosen i'm chosen but they're not and I actually started questioning, bro. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you know what? A lot of, so the dying and rising God, this book right here, I have it right on hand. It's called On Isis and Osiris. It's by Plutarch. This is written in the first century. And it's not just about Isis and Osiris. It's about all the dying and rising gods. Mm. What, what Plutarch was doing in this book, I, I, I want to, if everybody out there can buy this book, do it. I'm telling you right now, it's not even that long. It's a little, it's a short Great, old ancient Greek manuscript by Plutarch, and he literally equates Mithra, Isis, uh, Osir, he, uh, Bacchus, Dionysus. He's, he's, he's like, he's wow. comparing them all in this book. And I was like, holy shit, people were really thinking about, and he's a high priest of the, of the Roman imperial cult, and he never mentions Jesus once in here. Like, that's odd. So then I'm looking around, and actually what got me to really doubt Christianity was not what was said about not not the miracles being crazy and it couldn't happen but was the lack of mentioning by the historians in the first so philo writes in the two in the 20s in the 30s you got uh plutarch you got a uh, pliny the elder writing in like the 40s or 50s they're writing encyclopedias about the same topics about prodigal births and all this deified people and they're not mentioning the big kahuna the one yeah. everyone should know who he is. He, he came back be, from the dead. He should the be world, on, right? He should be on every page. <laughs> and there's, I'm just like, wow, that's very strange. That nope. Yeah. And then the, so that kind of got me to like really think like, what is going on here? 
You know what I'm saying? 100%, bro. I, I think for me, it was first all going in, in the direction of astrotheology and allegory. So like my deconversion was soft and subtle and it was a gentle land. I was in the clouds as a Christian. My, my ideology is way up here. And I did not want to crash and burn the aircraft. I just couldn't. I was afraid. I was scared of hell. There was a lot of stuff. Yeah. So what I then realized is God got bigger than just Christianity. When I saw that oh there was a God. connection. So true. So true. God predetermination. Became, predetermination. Yeah, everything. Absolutely. And it's the only it way like, it works. I couldn't get my mind out of the idea that God was the God of He was showing himself like you've heard the poem of the six wise men of Hindustan. Yes. It's talked about the six wise men of Hindustan. To learning much inclined, they all went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind. And they, yeah, they're all reaching, yeah. They all touch different parts and describe yeah. God, the elephant. No, he's like a fan. No, he's like a spear. And they're all, at the end, they're arguing. It's a beautiful, and beautiful poem, by the way. Beautiful. They're arguing and fighting, and they're, and they're all going, and, and they're arguing about what they mean about an elephant that none of them have seen. Right. And it was so good to make me go, well, God, the way I understood it at the time, was He's in all religion. That's what I started doing at the end. When I was leaving my church, I had my one friend who doesn't talk to me anymore because, because of what happened, because right. of me leaving. But he was the only one I would start, I would start, because I was, you know, you don't want to be in the church talking about this stuff because you just know, you know how they all are. They're all super, there's no, you're not, you know, you're not going to convince them anything. But I had that one friend who I was like, listen, man, I go, it, this can't be, I go, it just can't. I go, there can't be a coincidence that all these, like in, in, in India, they got the Trimurti. It's another trinity over there. And there's no way that this Osiris was, they were eating the bread and drinking the wine the same way. I go, this can't be. And I go, the only way for this to work is if God predetermined all this. And it's all pointing to Jesus. <laughs> and I was like, that's the only, so I became a total full-blown predeterminist where everything was predetermined and it was all intertwined. And then even the Zodiac, the 12 constellations, they were pointing to the 12 disciples of Jesus. It's all points. It's okay, all predetermined. So you did something different than me there. So I became a predeterminist within Christianity. So I became what you call a Calvinist. Right. And I only had it within the bubble of Christianity. So God, like, I actually saw that Calvinists were not consistent. I said, look, here's your problem, guys. You guys are acting like God's not the author of sin or evil and all this because he doesn't sin. Because you're reading James. In the book of James, it talks about God does not tempt or this or that. Uh, they're trying to refer to Satan. But right. when you read it, it's like God literally puts them in a garden. And he's supposedly all-knowing. You start with the idea that God knows everything. He puts them in a garden so that they would fall. How the hell are you saying he had – like he wanted that to happen or he wouldn't have placed yep. them in this garden where the snake is, where this fall is. Yes. And so it's all part of the plan. This is the way I looked at it. But I didn't connect it with other gods. It was only later when I found out through first hearing about Zeitgeist and putting it on a shelf, not giving two flying you-know-whats about it. And I said, all right, uh, let, me, let me try and focus on something I could grasp because this was way over my head on even knowing how to look up these sources, any of that. I kind of went to a Bible kind of angle, but then I talked to an atheist who was astrotheology guy. He was very close friends with Acharya S. at the time. Yeah, And he said, look, can I tell you something? And I'm like, first of all, you sound like an atheist. I need to know. I mean, and he goes, why does it matter? And I said, I just want to know. I'll keep listening to you, but I just want to know. Now, why am I even asking that question to him? Obviously, I'm afraid that he's going to he's gonna say something that might hurt my faith, right? And like, he goes, look, dude, I'm an atheist. I don't care if you want to think there's something out there. That's fine. I just want to tell you some stuff about the Bible that you might find interesting. So right. he compared Hercules and he compared Hercules to Jesus and Hercules to Samson. And he was showing this. And I'm ah. like, why? I was like, why is, why is Samson better? Why, why, why is Jesus better? You know, I started asking questions I would never have been allowed to ask. Yeah. And that led me on this path to astrotheology. And Gosh. then not only that, precession of the equinoxes, which I'm sure you're aware Gosh, of. The ages, the whole, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I did the a video on that on my channel. Yeah. So there's the, the 24 hour rotation, the 365, and then there's the 24 to 26,000. Right. And most people just go right to 24,600. Right. As this 24,600 year rotation where the earth spins like a top. Right. And, and wobble. Yeah. Yeah. There's 12 sectors within this. We're going into the age of Aquarius right now. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I, I mean, I do think that there's probably potentially validity to some degree on some of these ideas. Uh, oh, that's actually that's actually science. It's not that they're real yeah. constellations, but what you said is actually real. The Earth, the Earth does wobble, right. and there are clusters of stars that they map out. It's just right. to show astro- astronomers where we are in the universe. That's all it is. It's not yeah, yeah, yeah. not like this. Not it's not like Pisces is alive or anything. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that. I'm not. Yeah. But no, yeah, that's true. That's real astronomy. What I'm getting at is, I guess, if we were to glean the Bible to find astrotheology, um, there there's quite a bit. There, there not is. every not every page. I used to think that when I first started coming out of this, I'm like, it's all astrotheology. Every word, yeah. it's all coded, gematria, yeah. all this. And then I realized, okay, it's in there, but it's yeah. just they just lay, it's just thrown in there whenever it's, whenever it's needed. You yes, know? like all right, the Lamb who came away to take. He, he behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world. Right? Um, there is an astrotheology interpretation of this, or there seems to be to me now a more clear explanation of saying, look, they they had a sacrificial lamb within the system of Judaism. Jesus is symbolically representing that and replacing it. Right. Um, one could still argue, well, where they're still in the age of Aries, and Aries oh. is a ram. Ram, yeah. But the ram potentially and a lamb, uh, you know, some people want right. to interchange a thing. Yeah. And then they want to go back and say, well, Taurus is this golden calf because it's a right. bull that's being worshipped in the Old Testament. And you're like, well, actually, if you look in Egypt, Egypt actually had bulls they were so well as weirdly enough that's just true to what you're saying because this constellation of orion is right next to taurus and the i i actually believe that the story of aaron and the bull is orion and the taurus i think there's some layer there not totally just a little bit because if you actually you actually know the reason why i think that if you i did a video on this if you actually look at the constellation ophiakis that's the like that's the hero. He was the 13th constellation. And I think a lot of the, I think a lot of the astrotheology in the Old Testament has to do with Ophiakis. Interesting. Yeah. Have you heard of Dave, Ma- Ma- Dave Madison? Ma- Madison? I think I've heard of him. I've interviewed him on my channel. He has a, a like his entire, all of his stuff is based on astrotheology and yeah. things like that. I wanted to have him on a long time ago because, you know, I came out of preterism. That's what got me excommunicated out of the Presbyterian Church, and then I was on my own. I became like kind of a lone wolf. Um, I believed that the New Testament taught Jesus was going to come back soon. There is no yeah. game to be played on the timing. There's no damn way you could stretch this thing two thousand years. Yeah, I didn't care about Second Peter three when people said a day is as a thousand years and a thousand. That doesn't matter to me. That's so ambiguous. Right. Jesus said the Apostle Paul said like. I he said, he said, some of you will not die before I return. Right. So I used to struggle with that. And I used to think, there's okay. So then I started thinking, maybe maybe he did come back. Right. And I started thinking, and then this is actually, now I still hold on to this one thing, right. where I think Revelation is an allegory of Titus and Nero. Okay. Nero being the Satan, 666. We all know that. It's not a, that's not a big secret. Right. You know, so you got Nero, and then you got the seven-year tribulation. Three and a half, three and a half, right? It's divided up into a three and a half. There was a three and a half period between the, when the war started right. and the 70 AD Titus sack in Jerusalem. It was exactly three, almost exactly three. Not exactly, but you know how the Bible is. They got to make it yeah. exactly. Yeah. That's what that that's three and a half period. And there's another three and a half period after that where the war continues till 74 AD. So it matches up. And I and I used to say when I was still when I was still I call myself a Gnostic at this point. Yeah. Like yeah, I, was, yeah. I was still talking to my Christians and I was like, you guys, you guys are getting the wrong thing. The church won out against the real Christians, the Gnostics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were the real ones. So I, this is this is how I deconverted. And I was like, Revelation already happened. They're like, what are you talking about? And I, I was explaining this to them. Yeah. And then I started realizing, I was like, wait a minute. What I'm saying could be true, but it doesn't mean this is just an allegory. This is just, well, this is just a great story in L- Revelation that has all these allegories of the time period. That's true. There, there's so much in Revelation. You can almost make things whatever you want them. Like the That's two witnesses true, true. in Revelation, right? I had a buddy of mine say he's writing a book on this right now, and I was like, okay. And he's like, I think these preterist IO guys are on to something. There's a group called Israel only. You probably aren't even aware of. Unless no, you're I know who they are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some of them are really pains in the ass, and then some there, of them yeah. are pretty chill. That I know the personal yeah. ones I talked to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. 
That's how um, every group of people are. There's always good yeah. people, you know, everywhere. But they want to say it's these two high priests, right? These particular two high priests. I said, okay. And he's like, but yeah, but what do you think? And I'm like, you want to say it means that? That's fine. I can give you two other explanations that are just as plausible and actually might change your mind right now. And he's like, give me one. And I was like, all right, real simple. All right, so there's two witnesses in the Old Testament traditionally supposedly didn't die. Now, one of them we think Moses died. But here's the thing. Some people say Moses didn't die. There are traditions that Moses was taken on the mountain. He was taken yeah, up. Heard that. They couldn't find his body. Remember, they went to go look for him. And they couldn't find him. Right. So he was taken. So was Elijah. Right. Well, who was on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus? Moses, Moses and Elijah. Elijah. Right. Who do they represent? The law and the prophets as witnesses to the Christ. Well, what do you find uh, in Revelation? Moses and Elijah. And he goes, oh, God, I got to rewrite my book. And I'm like, yeah. dude. I said, no, my point is write your book. But my point is, is like, there's so many ways to make this thing yes. work. Yes. It's just fun to do, but it's like, don't be dogmatic. But, That's all I'm saying. And and it's a good, and that's why I still respect it more than I like. You got people. There's there's some people who are like the atheists that are just like so dogmatic, they so stupid. They're yeah. like it's so dumb. It's so every page is just it's just they didn't know what they were. No, like Revelation is some real deeply layered symbolism, and it's, it's interesting, rich and pure. Like it's great. It's great reading. It's good poetry. Whatever you want. So I still have a respect for it. It's just right. now that I know the history, especially when you look at you when you look at the history, like the uh, the Flavian era, and you look at the Talmud has these dialogue between the high priest Yohanan, where he sneaks out of Jerusalem and he goes and meets Vespasian, and then he says to Vespasian, "You are the king." You are the anointed one. Or he didn't say anointed one. He said, you are the one that's prophesied in all these verses. Deuteronomy, Psalms, Proverbs. They're all, they're all talking about you. You are king. And Vespasian's like, hmm, okay, well, what do you want? Let's make a deal. And he's like, I'm going to sack Jerusalem. He said, but what? He said, but just don't touch Yavne and its sages. And leave Gamaliel and leave this city. And they make a deal. And, that's, and, and so I started thinking, that's probably the rapture that they're talking about. Those are the the Jews that aligned with Vespasian are the ones that were raptured. You know what I'm saying? Now, this is an interesting point you make because I would like to distinguish what happens in the synoptics from actually what Paul believes. This is my yeah. opinion. I think that when it talks about Matthew, for example, 24, and he says some will be taken, some will will be you know kept, like stay there. Um, this rapture, I do think it's pretty clear to me in the Synoptic Gospels that this is the Jewish war. Okay, this yeah. is what's happening. When you go to Paul, though, I do not harmonize because Paul, here he is in Thessalonica. Okay, this guy is not, he's 1,500 which is, miles Which is away. Macedonia. And yeah, he's up in the saying, north. But he has this weird teaching where he's like, look, the, Thessalon the Thessalonians are like, look, my, my uncle, like, just giving you an example, the pretty much Steve Mason, the Josephus scholar I've had on. Oh, yeah. I, love yeah, I watched that whole video, by the way. It was in oh, class. I had my notes awesome. and everything. Taking notes. Yeah, he's like, you guys. half conversations we're, in, we're peeking into on Paul's writings. And he said, yeah. in this, the Thessalonians are upset. And they're like, Paul, my uncle Bob, my aunt Sally, they died. Like, you said we were going to be taken. And... Then all of a sudden, Paul's like, don't worry, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who remain in our life, and he's speaking of himself, yes. okay, will be taken up with the Lord. Now, that I don't think is talking about the same thing as what we see in Matthew 24, where it's talking about the temple. I could be wrong here. I'm just saying, yeah. if we were to try and decipher what he means by one left in the field and one not, it makes me think Jewish war, because some had to flee to the mountains. like. Yeah. You know, why are you telling your saints that you're supposed to take off the planet Earth to run to the damn mountains? It doesn't make oh. any sense. Yeah, it's crazy. Sometimes I wonder what they're talking about when they talk about the New Jerusalem. I wonder if they're talking about an actual city being built. Like, for example, the Nicene region was being like Constantinople, which was Byzantium at the time, right. was being built as like this new Christian center. And then you got the church called Hagia Sophia, was the biggest Christian church in the world, being built right around that time. I, I almost wonder if they're talking about the building of the Eastern Roman Empire. 
as like this new and I don't know that. That's yeah. just speculation. But um who, I you do know. know some scholars that I have listened to some lectures on. I'd have to find them for you. You might like it. It's really yeah. good. They're not connecting that kind of dots, but what they do is they go into Matthew, right? And they say this very Jewish book has some what we would call some anachronistic stuff in it. And we're like, what is it? And he said, well, let me show you that the Gospel of Matthew has replacement theology in it. And I'm like, listening to, to know more about what this guy's saying, I'm traveling across the United States, right? And I'm playing like one video after another and just, you know, you just digest tons of information. And he said, well, um, the church replaced Israel. And you see indication of it in Matthew, right? And you got to ask yourself, what nation replaced the nation of Israel? I mean, are they just a bunch of spiritual Israelites or what? Well, or are we saying that the Romans they actually are changed now... the name of the city to Capitolone, uh, Alia Capitolona. So Jerusalem was gone for right. a long, uh, until the Muslims got it back. They, moved, they changed it back to Jerusalem. But it was, I think this was after the Bar Kokhba revolt, though. I don't know if it was after the 70 AD revolt. Because after, the, I think it was after the Bar Kokhba, yeah, that's probably what it was. After that, they changed the name of Jerusalem to Alia Capitolona. Capitolona. So it's like, that makes you wonder, too. Is this even the same location anymore? Is this new right. church, the new temple? And then you also have to figure it, and you also have to factor in, like, um, the, the 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 bishops from the Roman imperial cult basically just switched over right. to the new thing by 325 AD, and they they make this succession of popes go back to Peter, but if you actually look at the history, it doesn't. No, the, the succession they, of popes well, starts literally starts when Constantine. Before that, they were all Roman imperial cult emperors. So the yeah, high the priest Gnostics did the, it too. The Gnostics, they, well, there was I, different it, lines of popes. You're, you're right. Yeah, they say they go Egypt back. Egypt had their own. Yeah, they Egypt had back. their own. Yeah. Yeah. So that might be true, but the, as far as the Rome, they did not go back to Peter. Oh, and, yeah. and and the, the 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 popes were all Caesar. Julius Caesar was a pope. He yeah. had the title of Pontifus Maximus. It actually is the same college of pontiffs, the same location. They just basically switched it over, like a Democrat losing. To oh, a Republican, yeah. and they just they take over the White House. Same deal. That, that's where we see this, like these December twenty fifth uh, definitely being incorporated. Um, trying to a keep lot it, of stuff, pagan stuff that flies in, and that's what makes it the most obvious is that you see, you see they're trying to deal with this new, like okay, we got to make everybody happy here, so we yeah. can't do these these diet laws. That can't happen. Yeah, like so oh circumcision. There's no way people in. in uh, People in Gaul are going to want to do circumcisions. Those people are a bunch of bun bunch of barbarians. They're not going to do that. And I'm just I'm not saying that's true. I'm saying that's what they thought. You know. Yeah. So they'd be like, oh yeah. So we got to make this new way. Oh, by the way, Peter had a vision. Just I had a vision. You guys can eat whatever you want now. The vision happened. So I'm Peter. Yeah. There's a you know there's an interesting point I, since you said you know about the Israel only guys. Yes. They try to say that Cornelius was an Israelite. Because they're like, he couldn't receive the Holy Spirit if he wasn't an actual ethnic Israelite in some sense, right. is their argument. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, it is interesting that Acts, the book of Acts, has Peter be the one who bumps into Cornelius. Now imagine, right? Acts of the Apostle, I, I'm like realizing this fictional history, it's not actually historically reliable in many respects, is trying to make Paul and Peter best buddies. Yeah. They're trying to make them one like oh the first the half is like Paul all about Peter. Then the second half is all about Paul. It's like exactly. split in half. So and and even then, like, okay, we know Galatians. Paul says, I am the disciple, or the apostle, really. I'm the apostle, not a disciple, to the Gentiles. And he even says in that letter, Peter to the circumcised, me to the un. So Peter did not go to uncircumcised people, according to Paul. Paul right. went to uncircumcised people people. Right. And here in Acts, the guy who bumps into an uncircumcised people is Peter, yeah. the guy who's not sent to them. So they have the opposite guy go to the opposite guy. And here you have Peter come to him and go, oh, nope, nope, there's no way. You're not, you're not a clean person. And then a right. vision from God, like Jonah had to run from God in Nineveh, and he's like, oh, I'm not doing this. And he goes on a boat and escapes. That's what Peter practically does. Right. But then God gives him a vision and says, hey, see these unclean animals? They're clean. 
yeah. don't call unclean what I call clean. Next thing you know, Peter comes back and goes, goodness gracious. Uh, it's just like from what I've heard, Muhammad, you know, in Islam is like, I got another uh, vision. Right, right, God. right, right. The you same know, like, thing. Yep. I'm allowed to have more than four wives, but you guys can only have four of them. You right. Know? Yeah. <laughs> it's so it's like they, they're taking the playbook right from the Christians. Like, if yeah, they can do it. We're going to do it now. If we, we get we a need, revelation, we, we can get away with hell. Let's do it. Right, right. And the funny part about all that is then you start to see in the epistles, they're arguing. And I don't know if they're trying to hide it or if they're trying to make it apparent. I remember the pastor I used to go to would always be like, they're not arguing. This is perfect word of God. God inspired it. There's no argument here. Yeah. And I would be like, wait a minute. James is saying, you ignoramus. It's about, it's about works, not just faith. And then Paul is saying, Peter's a hig- ignorant. He acts one way to the Gentiles and one way to the Jews. And then in another book, Paul says, I act one way to the Gentiles and one way to the Jews. I'm, I'm everything to everybody. I'm like, what is going on? These are a bunch of hypocrites, dude. Yeah, I think it shows the humanity behind That's it. That's true. You're right. Uh, well put, too. I became a Jew to Jews and a Greek to the Greeks. I become all, all things to all people, wherever possible. But Peter's a hypocrite for the same thing. Yeah, Peter's a hypocrite. <laughs> like, for it. What is going on here? Yeah, because he said, well, when they weren't around, you were cool. But then when they come around, you little hypocrite, you ran. But one thing that Paul does do is teach grace through faith, not of works. In Romans, it's clear. And then in pseudo Paul in Ephesians, a lot of people don't think Paul wrote Ephesians. Um, he writes, obviously, it is grace through faith and not of works. Uh, you've been raised from the dead, et cetera, in Ephesians 2. Right. And that is a total jab at works based and here right. you have james saying no dude middle finger like right that's wrong he even calls this him is, an ignoramus he literally is ignoramus he goes it was it was uh abraham it was the works that he did by putting J- uh isaac on the altar that's works I'm yeah like, yeah he said he was justified by his works exactly and here in Galatians, Paul said before any law, before anything was given, he was justified by his faith. Now, what he means by faith is not what James, I think, means in the book of James, where he says, you want to see my faith? Look at my works. Right. You see, and like he starts to get, it gets real nitpicky. There's already. You see this like clash happening between the two sides. Yeah. Right. You know what really gets me, from what I understand, Dr. Price does a lot of this. I got to get more videos with him on this topic. In one of the pseudo-Clementine letters, Peter has an argument with Paul. This is early church material, right? And Peter says, look, man, you had an angel of light appear to you, but I don't trust that. We had the Lord himself teach us, right? Right. And... It's, it's weird that you would find this in the early church where Peter's already saying, Paul, we don't trust your testimony that Jesus appeared to you as a vision. And in the New Testament, there's a part where I think Paul says this, which is so funny. He says, uh, nobody teach another gospel. Um, and I could be wrong, but it says something like, even if an angel of light comes to you and tries to teach you another gospel, don't. Don't believe That's crazy. it. And then you start thinking, like me, and myself, I start thinking, who is Paul to tell the guys that were with Jesus what to do and what they are? They're, they were the 12, man. Paul wasn't one of the 12. But, like, what's funny to me is a lot of these Christians today are big Paul followers. Mm. And, they, and sometimes, so you, like, the pastor I, was, I used to be, I, I keep bringing him up, but he would always talk about the 12 kind of being a bunch of dummies. Like they, they, it was right in front of their faces. Thomas was <laughs> doubting the whole time. They're all a bunch of, but he, Paul is great. Paul is amazing. He's the one that we should like, and they just, he puts Paul up on a pedestal. And it's like, I always think about why would that be? Well, you know what I mean? Seen, did you, okay. So there's an episode I did with Steve Mason. I love that guy, man. The guy's Mason awesome. talks about this and Mark, Mark, the earliest gospel. He said, Okay, I brought it up to him because I heard about this theory. And I said, look, uh, you pointed out that the final ending on Mark wasn't there. It ended on the women were afraid. We have no reason to really be strong in the, in the evidence of saying verse 9 through 16 or whatever the ver- verse 9 through 20 something. I can't remember. Right. That ending was not there. And, I, and he goes, well, I asked him, I said, Mark seems to be very Pauline. 
okay? Mark even has the same phrase in Greek that Paul uses for my gospel. It really means my announcement because even right. when like an emperor would come in, they'd say, hey, um, look, here is the gospel of Emperor Julius Caesar. And you're like, right. whoa, what? That Evangelion so, word, right? Yes, it's his message and he's yeah. coming to present his message. And Paul says, here's my gospel, my Evangelion, my message. Yes. And Mark uses it, but guess who doesn't? Matthew. So here's what's really, really interesting. Matthew does not open, here is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whoa, Mark does. Mark ends on, and the women were afraid. Nothing fancy. Matthew says, no, no, that ain't going to work for me, buddy. I got I to gotta stop yeah, the so game. You, re you rechanged. It makes it more Judaized, yeah. I think. I think, but in Mark, I think that was the point. The disciples are nimwits. They're, they're idiots. Yes. They, don't, they never get it, and it's right there. Yes. And Paul does. So I said. That's why my pastor was like that, I think. I think, yeah, they've yeah. got good reason to think that. But he's ignoring Matthew. It must be that Mark's his favorite. Or, or Luke, because Mark has this bad down look even on jesus's biological family aren't believers there they don't believe and right. uh even a prophet's not accepted in his own and town joseph's never stuff. mentioned again after the first couple chapters that's it he's right gone. so it's all like, of this stuff is like not pointing in a good direction but right. then matthew when we set them up side by side matthew corrects mark so when the the disciples look idiotic all of a sudden they look like they understand in matthew yeah. They ma Matthew makes them understand the message of Jesus, whereas Mark doesn't. Right. And if, imagine this, if there's someone watching this who's kind of listening going, huh, I never really thought about this. Mark, if, you, if that's our earliest gospel for good reasons we believe it is, and it's painting the disciples as nimwits, right. like we have nothing earlier to support them. There's no textual data coming from Peter himself. Oh, but Derek, you're ignoring first and second Peter. Have you looked at the scholarship and realizing that these are not written by Peter? You right. should really consider this. But anyway, right, right, right. I asked him, I said, why do you think Mark does this? Do you think it's possible that Mark is in line with Pauline tradition? Yes. Where Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, I don't care about these super apostles. He mocks the super apostles. That he, makes a lot of sense, dude. That makes per is. actually makes perfect sense because like that's what he Paul wants people to think. Like I'm the guy. I'm, I'm the guy the one you need that to go got to. the yeah. got the You don't need to go to them. Go to me. That's what it's basically. And, and you're right. Mark Mark is the perfect gospel for Paul's message. These bunch of idiots. They saw it in front of their faces and they still doubted. Thomas. He saw all those miracles and he needed to see the hole in his hand to believe it. What a <laughs> what an idiot, right? Right. So, I think that, yeah, that's that's later embellishment, obviously, to try and solidify the naysayers and scoffers who say he didn't rise from the dead. And they go, no, 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 he literally, look at this, look at this, right. Thomas, there's this guy we knew named Thomas. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there's an answer for everything in the Bible. Like, there's every question, like, oh, why can't he do a miracle for us? Oh, don't, 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 uh, don't test the Lord. You can't tell, oh, you'll never get a sign except for the sign of Jonah. There's an answer for it. It's all worked out so that just you can't you can't poke a hole in it. It's all well, yeah, they 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 know how to do gymnastics. Oh really yeah, good. oh masterfully. I mean, and you know what's amazing? The Christians are doing no different than what the Muslims are doing because the Muslims say the Quran is the miracle. When I say like like what claims do you have? They go well look the the miracle is the Quran. And if you ask a fundamentalist Christian, all right, is the Bible perfect? They go there's no problems with it. You especially the King James ones. Oh, the King James is <laughs> perfect and pure. Yeah, and you got to imagine, like, okay, so technically you also believe in a perfect, miraculous book. Right. And so, it has a unicorn in it, by the way. The King James yeah, Bible has a unicorn in it. A fire-breathing dragon in Job, literally. <laughs> yeah. You do know that, right? Leviathan, he says, can you, Job, he says, can you uh, capture him? with a hook, can you pierce his skin? And he says, can you play with Leviathan like a bird? Then he goes down further and he says, fire breathes from his nostrils. And it's like, and that's crocodiles why, don't do that. And that's why Job, I think, is, is really old as, as the scholars say it is, because it's, it sort of has a polytheistic feel to it, where the sons of God lined up in front of, and the Satan, he's like the district attorney in the court. And yeah. if you actually look at the history of the religion and around that time period, there was the court of El. It was a polytheistic Canaanite religion with El as the king, and there was Yahweh or Jehovah. There was Asherah was the wife. 
and they had like 12 deities and they had and I, I got maybe that's what the, that came from it, make, it would make some i don't know that for sure like i'm not yeah you know I, mean? I don't know about 12 deities i i know that there's seven there actually more than that I think it was yeah there was more than that that's what was, yeah there was I 70 sons 12 of but i meant yeah. in deuteronomy 32 but i don't know you know you're right because canaan i mean bro let's be honest right horus there were 12 horses we right. what that means we're not sure like it could be that there were 12 actual horses that represent i don't get into the whole weird if you change the letters you found hours i've heard some of these really like fringe theories out there and stuff I listened to them as I came out of Christianity, but now I'm like, I got real dudes with real serious right. scholarship that I don't, I don't have to go to that. But right. you're right about Job, bro. I, I, Job supposedly wasn't even an Israelite. Number one, right? Um, There's also, no mention, no mention of Israel in there at all. So it yeah. could be some like Canaanite scripture that got brought into the fold. That was maybe it was so good because Job is really good written. It's written so good. Oh yeah. Yeah, like, I where were you when I fastened the world? And who created... is this that darkeneth words by counsel? <laughs> dude, especially King James, man. That shit hits, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude. And that's that's actually the way that God answered him. He was finally like, dude, he finally gave up in a way in his mind. Like, he was kind of, it seems like he was just, man, I shouldn't have been born. You know, at the end, he kind of gave up. And then God comes and says, with this whirlwind, he says, who is this that darkeneth the words by counsel? Oh, you know, the King James. Written and so he's beautiful. Like, You're going to answer me. You're going to gird up your loins like a man. And the way I understood that, <laughs> yeah. I didn't even know what all this meant. It's like my dad, you know, he was a Green Beret in the Special Forces. So, like, yes. he used to say to me, grab your balls, son, like a man, you know. And it's like, gird up your loins like a man and answer me. That's what I thought God was saying to yeah. him when I first read it. It was like, grab your cojones yeah. and answer me like a man. That's what and I, I thought, too. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> You know, I thought about something. You were talking about the what Steve Mason said about the Evangelion, the good news. Interestingly enough, in the Talmud, we were talking about the Talmud, the, the part about Vespasian and the high priest Yohanan. He says to him, Proverbs something, and he goes, good news puts fat on the bones. Because I guess Vespasian has got the news that uh, Vitellius was the last murder, just got murdered, which makes him the Caesar, the king of the world, basically. And the first thing that's said to him is good news puts fed on the bones. Mm. Like, wow. If you, I mean, that wasn't Hebrew, but it's like the people probably thought about that. Maybe if you look at it, it's like Evangelion. I don't, I'm, it's just a connection. It's weird. Yeah, it's news. possible that they had some significance looking back. Um, I like the, we couldn't prove that. I don't think. No, not at all. It is interesting, but I definitely. That's one thing about me you'll, you'll see is I speculate a lot, but I always admit. Yeah. I'm just speculating. Yeah, like, I'm just having fun. fun. This is yeah, this is all I'm doing. You know what I mean? I'm with you 100, percent bro. I think um, I personally think that more of like it's in the air there, and that this Paul being a Roman who understands the Greco-Roman world. I mean, if we took Acts to possibly represent Paul somewhat, that he attended synagogues all the time, but he also was talking to God-fearing pagans that were interested in the God of Israel. And right. he goes in Acts 17, he literally gives this presentation to these, these, <laughs> I love this, this part right here, the Stoics and the Epicureans. Right, right, like, right. like, what is this strange teaching? Let this rambling babbler say what he wants. And he comes up and he's like, okay, I know that you guys are super religious. I he's like, you got a, a, a statue of the unknown God. Yeah. Which and is he's true. Like, that was actually yeah. a thing with the Stoics. They, they were like, because a lot of Stoics were like, we don't. Unless I, unless God shows up in my face right now and says I am this person, we don't know that. So for all we know is maybe there is a guy that created everything. They were like basically agnostics, like yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, go yeah, ahead. That, yeah, there's a lot of Stokes that were like that. You're right, yeah. and there were some really cool history of some some uh, emperors like that. But what I liked about what Paul says there is he's like from one man, all the nations of the earth are created and put in their their sundry places. There's your King James for it, right? Uh, put in these particular locations and determined that they would be set in these boundaries. All right. He's quoting Deuteronomy 32 by doing that. But right. then he does this syncretism where he's like Deuteronomy 32 and Epimenides. Well, what the hell? He goes in him. We move, we breathe, we have our being for we, he says, and your own poets have said for we too are, his offspring. Yeah. Well, Epimenides was an ancient Greek poet that right. actually said uh, Zeus. Yes. That they were the offspring of Zeus. Yep. And sure enough, here's Paul saying, look, humanity is the offspring of the God. And I thought it was interesting, too, that he says, 
and God does not dwell in temples made by hands. Ooh, if right. Paul was really saying that, That's no wonder message. he's up there, not in Jerusalem. That's the whole point of the New Testament is to make this Hellenized form of Judaism. And not, and I'm speculating here, but the, the Hellenized version, the sort of like Philo, Philo, yeah. the way the, the Philo's theology is the New Testament. I basically. got confused when you said that. I was like, Philo, you mean? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah Philo, Philo. I, I always say names wrong. It's okay. But, Don't but, worry. But, but like I was saying, it's like they're trying to get away from this whole, we have to go to the temple and go to the Jews to get all this. We can just do it ourselves. And like, and they're also like, if you read the dissertations at the end of the book of Josephus, like I got this William Whiston, very great English translation. It's so thorough and it, it attached like Tacitus at the end and all these dissertations and put it all in context. And they were writing about like Paul or I'm sorry, not Paul, um, Plato and, and Aristotle being divinely inspired. And oh, these yeah. are Jewish, the Jewish theologians saying this stuff. And basically what I, what I think happened in the first century was it was a clash of the Judaism, the Judaism world and the Greek stoic, you know, the Plato platonic world. And that's More what you get. That, because here you have Josephus talking about Samaritans and Jews still have this animosity. And there's this clash between the Samaritans and the Jews. And I do personally take that prodigal son parable to be about the northern house of Israel and Judah, or the Jews, okay? And I personally see that the, the son who was lost into the pigsty is viewed by the author as the Samaritans. Wow. And here in the first, notice we also see the implication of the good Samaritan. Why are these parables showing up? They're trying to mend a disconnect between Samaritans and Jews. Now, Gentiles are something that Paul does, and man, does it take over. It becomes like that wild bush that literally takes over the whole bush. You think, yeah. okay, we're going to keep those guys on the sidelines. But when Paul opened that door, <laughs> the floodwaters took over and sure enough, pagans became the majority. But I see it as like you have Samaritans and Jews and here you have in John, which is a late book. Yeah, and this very gnostic going, too, very gnostic -y. Yes, there are very Gnostic tendencies. And he's- and Logos. She says, she says, well, when the Messiah comes, he'll know. Well, I who speak to you am he. And she's like, and he tells her everything about her. She says, our father Jacob dug this well. And da, 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 da. And he says, look, we Jews know who we worship. But he says, we're neither going to be worshiping on this mountain, Jerusalem, or Mount Gerizim in spirit and in truth. He's already, like you said, destroying, or the author is already destroying the idea of the temple yeah. needed, that temple or that mountain needed you don't need that you don't need this yeah when i was with james valiant um we were talking about how this is basically what they're trying to, this is okay so the jewish roman war right goes hand in hand with the creation of christianity because it's propaganda the most effective form of propaganda is religion so like for example the parable of the fig of cursing the fig tree is the short and sweet but it's the most it's the most like Im almost important one because that's the entire point the entire point is you jews are nothing compared to rome we're we're taking on we like your idea by the way with this whole one god thing and you know but this is ours now we're the messiah mm. curse curse that fig tree and so but basically what you're getting is you're getting this you're trying to get the jews to jump ship and follow your way and not their way and by stepping foot in their temple, like Pompey the Great did, when they said, if anyone steps in our temple, they'll be smote on the spot. Only the Levite priest can come in the temple. Pompey the Great's like, oh, yeah? Want to see me try? And walks right in there and nothing happens to him. And those th things like that are such a big deal that no one talks about. But back then, it was the, the, some, the Jews that saw that probably lost their faith that day. There's probably a bunch of Jews that lost their faith that day and probably left Israel probably went to move to Greece somewhere or Egypt or something. And like you're, and that started the snowball effect of Rome, basically putting themselves in their place as the owners of the Mediterranean world. And the Jews, are, they're just, that's, that's, that's our back country. That's our country. That's part of Rome now. Right. And, and in our, even, go ahead. No, I was well, going to say, gonna, James Zion is brilliant. I mean, yeah. I don't know completely if I could buy the whole Roman provenance position. All right. There's I, some I, truth to it, though. You know, 
it's hard for me to know. I think the truth is that the way both sides are going to interpret the data is different. That's the true. The data is, here's the thing. The data is clear that the New Testament is absolutely ass-kissing Rome, period. Yes. I don't care how you want to chop it up. Yeah, you, you, know, you can't deny that. Right. Now, why is it doing that? Maybe a different question. Now, when I say New Testament, let me not universalize, because I do think personally, you have a different spin on Revelation. I think Revelation's actually a coded message for a reason, and it actually is talking about the soon destruction. I actually think they're thinking that Rome's going to be destroyed. This is what I think that I've heard I this before. This, this is actually this is true to this. I can I can dig this, but go yeah, ahead. I honestly think that this guy thinks it's going down. And Elaine Pagels helped me to actually start pushing over to this. Then I started re reading John J. Cal Collins' wife's work on this, and oh my God, it's unbelievable the 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 ancient chaotic dragon myth that's found in Revelation 12 and like right. all of this stuff. But uh, long story short, she said, and I don't want to lose track of my idea of the Roman provenance. So just keep that in your mind okay. while okay. I mention this. I yes. just think this is important. She said. Here's this guy, John, on the island of Patmos, which is right near Ephesus. And she says that the setting is around 90 AD, 90-ish. Here's John. He's flee Jerusalem because of what happened in the war Roman War. Right. And here's this Jew walking in Ephesus, and he sees this 20-foot-tall, massive statue of this god-man named Domitian. And Domitian is conquered. And there's this temple in Ephesus with 30 giant car we still have the archaeology here of like paint the they're chiseled out images one has nero with a knife to a slave girl's throat and she's trying to fin fiend him off like get off of me and he's wow. cutting her throat and there's 30 pictures in stone of 30 nations that are conquered and one of those nations is israel exactly okay and here he is this man who believes his god is true watched what just happened to jerusalem looks at this wall with these pagans, these uncircumcised. The menorah, boys, the menorah being carried off. Carried off, gone, Titus's Ark, you name it. And then all of a sudden this guy's saying, hell no. God, I know you aren't going to let this stand much longer. So here he is writing to the seven churches, which are located in Asia Minor, right near where he's at, at the island of Patmos. And he's saying, get ready. Get ready. Get right. It's got to happen. It's going to happen soon. And then, you know what really gives me a huge red flag? Yeah. The Jews persecuting Christians within the narrative of the New Testament, like by law, the best they would have done is thrown stones at them and stone them to death. We see that in Stephen and Acts, right? right? Right. They wouldn't have cut people's heads off. Only Rome would. In fact, we have a tradition that Paul's head was cut off right. by Rome, right? Well, here you have the heads of the saints that were beheaded or the saints that were beheaded under the throne when you get into the visions in Revelation, and they're crying out, the beheaded saints, by the way. Rome did this in history. We have good reason to see Rome actually cutting the heads off of Jewish possible messianists. What I'm saying is Christianity may not have been what we see Paul saying. Early Christianity might have been a messianic type of movement like James Vine said. That, that works, yeah. But here's the thing. They're beheaded. Well, Jews didn't do that. But hmm. the Romans did. There so you here go. you have beheaded saints crying out, how much longer, O oh Lord, are you going to wait? And then at the end of the book, he says, don't worry, I tarry not. I cometh quickly. Right. And he's coming with this sword. He's ready to defeat. He's leading 144,000 virgin Israelites from 12 tribes. Of the, you know, And he's coming. Was he going to come kill his own people? Right. I, I think he's coming to take on Rome. And, they and, do, just, and there is the theory, and it's a really strong theory that Babylon is Rome. It's just so. And by the I way, Elaine Pagels, when she says something, I listen. That yeah, lady, she's, dude, she's she a Gnostic. She knows what she's talking about. You do know she's an actual Gnostic, right? I, I, I actually identify with her form of Gnosticism. Like, right. Not like the Yale, the Boeth, and like the Demiurge type of Gnostic. But she, like, I don't think she does either. No, I know. And that's what I'm saying. Her version of Gnosticism makes sense to me. Right. And then people, believe it or not, people. People think all scholars are atheists. It's not true. Yeah. There's a lot of scholars that are just like, well, you know, I like Taoism, some of them are Buddhist. Buddhist? I got, dude, yeah. I know some of them, but. The way I am, I, so there's definitions of atheism, and I fail out of them. Like, I don't, none of, there's no Zeus, there's no Yahweh. All yeah. those gods don't exist. Right. Now, the universe is pretty freaking magical. If you look around, like, yeah. stars and stuff. 
Could there be, could be, we'd be in some could simulation. Be. It could be in some simulation. Who knows? Could be. I don't know what you define that agnosticism. I like the way when Elaine Pagels talks about the like how her, her Gnosticism theory, I'm like, I can dig that. Yeah, I sense. personally, you know where I fall now. Like uh, right now, where I'm at is I'm I'm thinking science is going to figure some stuff out. We just don't know some stuff yet. Yeah. And and look, uh, nine times out of ten, we thought in antiquity. Uh, the volcano erupting god was bad because you were acting in sin uh why didn't billy keep the sabbath that's why the babylonians <laughs> kicked our ass it's like no yeah, hold on right. billy had nothing to do with why the babylonians kicked your ass you know um i like to the, explain these things naturally right i love like like the taoist philosophy of like just flow like water just do your dharma just find your purpose in life and don't worry you're gonna be fine you didn't ask to be born it's like yeah. You were you were you were raised you were born without your knowing. Who knows? You might get brought up again you know, in some other life, some reincarnate. We don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the thing. But... You can't. As soon as you let go of like trying to find the, what the truth is, it's just like it's like all this weight's lifted off of you. You're just like, mm -hmm. I'm. I am who I am. I, you know, I'm just gonna go with it, and I'm gonna do the best I can. I found comfort in just a journey and huh. and just enjoying the ride. Rather than pretending you have the answer and you already know the conclusion, right. you're just there for the ride. And I'm I'm there now too, where it's like, and I think lot, this no, goes I'm into sorry. the addiction thing, though. This goes yeah. into the addiction. Like, what what made me get this much time clean? Like, what has helped me along the way stay clean? And people go, God or this or that. Right. And it's like, actually, I just finding, got sick of it. I got. For me, I just got tired of going not, to jail and all that stuff. That was like, I'm done, bro. I, I would have kept going. No, like, I know that's true, though. That's a good point because like I did, I, while, I did keep forget, going for a while. Yeah, you forget about how bad things were. You try one other thing and it leads you back. Yeah, but for me, bro, I found comfort in n knowing that I don't know. Yeah, knowing that you don't know all the answers. There's something and you beautiful learn. about that. There's something beautiful yeah. about being being like, okay. I don't care where the truth takes me, but I'm going to follow truth. Yep. So if someone can come to me and show me that I'm wrong about something, then I got to relook what I'm, what I'm doing. <laughs> right. There's something about that. That's like powerful. I agree. Cause you, you become like, I don't know how I, I can't explain it, but I'm sure somebody knows what I'm talking about out there. There's something no, about it. There's something about I letting go of being, trying to be right. Psychologically it's relieving. Cause you're not like tense about, all of your truth claims and being dogmatic and right. what if i am wrong like i am wrong i know i'm wrong about a lot well you know I what know i don't know a lot of christians that claim to be like oh i know i'm going to heaven all that okay well then why are you still here why, why are you eating healthy why do you want to live so long why aren't you just like, listen to this the pastor the one i brought up like four times you <laughs> I, and I want to hear your story of the craziest thing you've heard in church before. This is the craziest thing I've ever heard in church. Okay. And it might be on the internet somewhere. Cause we, I used to, I used to do his live streams for him. That's, that's how I know how to do all, all this editing stuff. Yeah. I was the live stream guy at the church. Anyways, oh, wow. he said this in front of everybody. He said, when you're saved, you're always saved. No matter what once saved, always saved. So even under his theology right now, I'm still saved. even though I don't believe anymore. But he said this too. He said, if I wanted to, I could take an AK-47, I can shoot all of you right now, and I can turn the gun on myself, shoot myself in the head, and I will wake up in heaven because I'm saved. He goes, that's what being saved means. <laughs> Bro, and then, I, and then now, I have I, never heard that. Yeah, that's crazy. I'm, I'm not kidding. It's what he said. But that, now I think back of what he said, and I'm like, why doesn't he do that then? If heaven's so great and perfect, why doesn't he? Why, what's he waiting for? Why don't you just go? You believe it that much, right? What are you doing here? So that means that makes me think deep down, he might not know this, but deep down his subconscious, he has a doubt. Everyone does. Oh yeah. He's so full of shit, dude. Make right. sure you tied this Sunday. Now that you felt better about all the sins you're now going to commit this week, because remember you're saved. <laughs> Isn't that me. nuts? Isn't that crazy? I'm serious. That, though, and yeah. that, and that made me read that name. That was like that, that hit me like, wait a minute. This doesn't make any sense. That's the whole point of this is just to believe in something. So if it's like, Two plus two is four, but I have to believe it's five. And if I don't, I'm like, I can't make myself believe something. Belief has to come 
with evidence and like like you you don't believe like sports for example your favorite sports team they go up against the, the number one team in the league it's, it's they're they're undefeated you in your ha- in your heart you don't believe that your team's your city's going to win that week you can't make yourself believe your team's going to win you can root for them and hope they win you can yeah. only hope but yeah. you can't make yourself believe something that you know is not likely it's impossible. You can be highly confident, but either way, you don't know. Uh, it's always there, no, no matter what. Can, even if you, even if you gets... tell yourself otherwise, you can't. Like believing something has to come with evidence and something you can show for. It. Otherwise, right. it's just you're just hoping. Well, the, you know, it's an interesting. You're opening up another. This goes into psychology and yeah. all sorts of stuff, but it makes me wonder. Like Heaven's Gate cult when they committed suicide, like. These guys were literally brainwashed to a point. I think they were convinced, but that doesn't mean there isn't some doubt. Like you said, there might've been somebody who got pressured into it. And even taking the drink, they're probably were freaking out inside, but they were there. This, the pressure got to them. Like yeah. the Jones thing. Everybody killed themselves with the Jones thing. You think everyone there really wanted to die. Oh, you can hear them screaming on exactly. the audio. Yeah. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's pretty insane. Um, that was, whoa, holy crap. And that's what, that's what we're up against when we, that's why we do the, that's why we do this stuff. Cause like, yeah. this is real, this is changing the minds of people. And like, you got people, uh, political parties being manipulated by religion. Look yeah. at our, look at our Congress in the United States. Who is, is there an atheist in there? I don't, I think maybe Andrew I Yang. Know. I think Andrew Yang's the only one. And who knows if he even is, but all of them are either Catholic or Christian or, and even if they're not, they just say they are because they have to, to get voted in, which is wild. You can't yeah, even yeah. be in government without having a religion background or some claim to religion or some ideology like that. It's it kind of crazy to think about. I know one of the early presidents in, in the 1900s, early 1900s, I can't remember who it was, but they were influenced by Zionist thinking and actually went and pushed for the idea of the establishment of Israel in the Middle yeah. East. And, and, um, and in their mind, they had the idea that the second coming of Jesus would come when we could bring the Jews back home. Yeah. It's been for, for half a millennia, yeah. you know, people have been looking for the lost tribes of Israel actually out there in expeditions, like yeah. in boats and oh, yeah. traveling horses going and looking for these guys finally they're like if we just get the jews back home then the end will happen and yeah they, they actually think now that israel is established like most baptist and evangelical pastors and churches think that we're like in the last two years like not 10 years like they think it's it could happen tomorrow like that's how close we are in their eyes i'm sure you've heard that yeah, there's so much in day, end of days. We're in the last hour. It's been going on for 2,000 years, which is why I said this the other day to the Muslims that were on my channel. I'm like, you guys, part of your ideology is that Jesus will return, okay? <laughs> um, no. like They've been saying work. that since, like, the, for example, the, the year 1,000. I forgot what the name of the pope was. Pope whatever, Alexander, I don't know. Yeah. Whatever the pope was back then, he would literally was telling the people this is the end of the world so get ready like do what you got to do like that's what they that, that, imagine turning on cnn right now and cnn's like well this is the end of the world everybody so just that's what the world was doing in the year 1000 right it was a thousand years so then they had then when the world didn't end you know what they did the pope had his, pope came back and made another message that oh it's 133 we got 33 more years now because it's got to be 33 the year jesus died thousand years from there so they from from the year 1000 to the year 1033 people were going crazy they thought the world was going to end that's because revelation talks about that thousand year reign exactly and, yeah and they're taking things so literal there's so Ask any historian they'll tell you that from the, those 30 years of time was a nut was a crazy time to be alive because they thought Dude. the world was ending i don't i don't doubt it honestly i mean look we had 1988 88 reasons why Jesus will come back in 1988. I mean, there's both. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. The seven day, the, the Latter day Saints, remember they had their end date in like 1865 or whatever uh, that came yeah. around. They had to Miller, change that. Something Miller, and I thought it was 18, like 40 something. But yeah, either way, yeah, it didn't Actually, happen. I'm going to show it right now as I'm speaking. Right now, I'm showing the this is the Wikipedia 
and showing all the end times uh, predictions that passed. As you can see, whoever's watching this right now, there's like a hundred here. <laughs> and they just kept coming. They just kept coming and coming and coming and passing. Even Isaac Newton was like, oh, the end of the world would probably be around like 2000. And that's Isaac Newton, a scientist. One of the most brilliant scientists that ever lived was a yeah. fundamentalist Christian. Which he is, actually wrote a lot on the Bible, actually. I've seen I a think, few of his interpretations. I think on, he wrote more about the Bible than he did about science. Yeah, it wouldn't shock me. Right, which is... It wouldn't shock me. But yeah, it's amazing what these things, what these kind of books do to people and how they interpret them. But I'm glad I'm like able to do this, what I'm doing now, and be critical and analyze. And now I'm doing that with the Quran. I'm trying to do that with that. I mean, I spent yeah. enough time on the Bible. I'm going to continue on the Bible. Don't get yeah. me wrong. But I'm like... Okay, yeah, I read the Quran Muslims too. Muslims aren't getting enough uh, attention by me. I think it's time to, you know. Give How far in the Quran have you gotten so far? You just started. Um, I actually haven't read the Quran yet okay. uh, because I've got so many trips coming up and what I'm doing right now with recordings. I'm going to Richard Carrier next week with yeah. Dennis McDonald. Uh, when it's I not long, back, by the way. You could read it in a couple of days. It's very oh, short. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I'm wait sure till, I will. Wait till you get the chapter called The Cave, El Kaf. There's two stories in there. That are ripped right from Greco, the Greco-Roman world. One of them is the cave story. They got these seven people go to sleep for, I don't know how many years, uh, 300 years, something like that. And they wake up and, there's a, and it's, it's an Islamic world now. The pagan world's gone. Yay. Well, that story was told by a, a, a priest from Constantinople hmm. 300, 300 years before that, like the 300s or the 400s, actually, uh, Emperor Theodosius. They said that they, they went to sleep when it was pagan Rome and they woke up under Theodosius. Same story. And then you got in the same exact book, the Al Kaf, you got the story about Dual Al Kainan, du, Dual Al Karnain. I think that's how you say it. I, I'm so bad with names. But it, you'll see if you, if you pull out the Greek Alexander romance, at the end of the Greek Alexander romance, there's a story about Alexander going up on these two mountains, it says. And he stood on the two mountains and he prayed to God. And God made the mountains turn into a wall. And the wall, the wall kept out Goth and Magoth. The, the Quran says uh, the horned one, do al Qaeda, stood on the two mountains, says the same exact thing. And he prayed to Allah, and Allah made a wall come, and he took out Gog and Magog. It's literally the same exact wow. paragraph. Yeah. So what you'll do you see do that. with that, right? Like, oh, well, this is really from God. God just sent it again. It's like, dude, just said it again, right? Face. <laughs> God just loves Greek poetry. Yeah, like he just loves the pagans' ideas. It's yeah, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, man, yeah. I, I think I, I think I took you, got you past your time, man. No, so you're fine. If you want, I can go a little longer. If you if you want to ask, I forgot more to remind you about um it, the Roman providence thing. Okay. Um, so we talked about ass kissing. We know yes. that the Gospels clearly have, I mean, Pontius Pilate historically is not the Pontius Pilate in the Gospels. Let's get, let's no, get not at all. obviously. In, in Josephus, he slaughters the Jews, literally slaughters exactly. them. He's ruthless. Which is literally. crazy. And that no mercy, the Bible. doesn't give a crap, hates them, right. actually, purposely would send people in disguise, not as soldiers, into the crowds, let them start to riot and get upset by something he did, right. then turn around and have them pull their swords out and start killing Jews, and then they would shut up. Um, obviously, eventually the complaints got to Rome, and I think Rome probably ended Pontius Pilate, like, you know. But um, Pontius Pilate is seen almost like a saint. I mean, the guy literally, like, like says, I find no fault with this guy. Like, yeah. He's like a philosopher asking the great philosopher, teach me what is truth? Like, get the hell what out of my truth? face. Dude. Right. You know, and so, so crazy. Yeah. So he, he's viewed pretty and then, well, let his blood be upon us and our children. Jews are viewed bad. Um, when you look at that, many people go, this is evidence that the Romans are behind the creation for many other reasons too. They might look at this nation will be taken to you, taken away from you and given to another nation. Um, this is in Matthew uh, the vineyard will be taken away and given to a new, you know, all this stuff. Um, with Paul saying, obey the government, it's from God, all that stuff. So pro-Roman angles, like the Roman provenance position, will go into many little details to express why they say Rome created it. And there's really good reason to think this is possible. I don't rule it out. Herodian involvement, all sorts of stuff. Um, but when I listen to Dr. Price, Dr. Price says, look, 
that's not the best explanation he thinks. He thinks the best explanation is a ground up model that you have a natural cult that develops and it's starting to realize, okay, we don't want the attention of Rome. We want, we don't want them on our side. We've seen what they can do. That's interesting. Evidenced by what just happened to the Jerusalem temple, for example. Right. All yeah. right. The gospels we know are written after that. We don't have to dispute that. Christians might want to dispute that with us. I don't even need to waste my time. No, I think you and me are on the same page. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So Paul's letters are where the dispute will come in on this. And Paul, uh, Dr. Price is okay with saying they're post 70 AD. He's okay with that. With me, I'm okay with the idea. Right. But for me, I'm like, I have no problem with saying they're in the 50s. Yeah. Like, you, why the hell would you say that though, D? I mean, why do you force them not to be in the 70s? I know Jacob Berman takes them into the yeah, 70s. Yeah, Jacob now. Berman's really trying to get that. Out yeah, there. Are you all, that's his that's his favorite topic is the dating the dating the epistles of Paul. I'm interested in hearing what he has to say. Mm -hmm. He makes a lot of great points though. He, yeah, 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 yeah. Jacob but makes great points. I thought the judgment of the Jews ideas were also great points, but then other scholars say that those are probably interpolations. Right. Uh, some of the ideas that, that judgment has come upon the Jews, people go, that's 70 AD. But then again, is it 70 AD? Is it possible that the judgment that come, come down on the Jews isn't specified? And then it could have just been that they were kicked out of Rome. Remember when, remember when the Jews were kicked out of Rome in the 50s? So there was a time in which, uh, in the 50s, if I'm not mistaken, under one of the emperors, they were kicked out of Rome. They weren't even allowed. Yeah. So is that what he means by judgment? I don't really know what right. he means here. Well, but, yeah, and that's the thing. is During that whole century, it was just craziness happening. War is breaking out even just little battles here and there skirmishes. Yeah. It was a rough time. So he, they could, there's a lot of things they could be talking about, but either way, what you're saying is really important because Christianity hangs on that thread of Paul. Yeah. If the, Paul, if the, if the dating of Paul's letters turned out to be in like the nineties, that's it. People are going to lose. They're going to be like, well, what do we have from? Yeah. I mean, if, even if it doesn't like, look at Paul, right? If Paul's writing in the fifties, he's still writing over two decades yeah, that's after true Jesus. I agree with that. You're talking 20 something years. And I just did a show where Josh McDowell has lied about his testimony. Yeah. We have him on video. We have evidence yeah. of this guy doing no, it. You know what's crazy is you got Dr. Habermas saying, well, it goes back to days and months after, after the cross, days and months. We have, we have reports that go back that far. Okay, let's see them. Oh, well, well, it's in Corinthians. Well, Corinthians is dated to the 50s, you just said. And we don't even have a manuscript for that to the second century. Right. So why are you saying days and weeks? You can't, you're just making that up. No, and, the and, best they do is try to argue that Paul converted three years. Probably they say Paul converted in 33 AD. So they think Paul became a Christian three years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, supposedly. Right. We, do we know this? No, we don't no, know this. Can't. So uh, it, we, it, have to, so we have to assume based on Pauline letters, and you can't really trust Acts to be – be certain about this because even Paul right. and Acts don't quite agree on things. But, um, but looking at Paul, for example, and we go, he's not really pro circumcision. He's very Hellenized, very open-minded ideas that no Jew would have ever done that. And I thought about this a long time ago. I used to think Paul was post 70. Ask James Valiant. Me and him used to have conversations of this because I said, bro, no one would be able to prosper with a pro certain form of Judaism, not allowing uh, circumcision and trying to say Torah is no more. How could he be teaching no, no be, more yeah. law and there's no temp and, there, unless, and the temple's still standing? Unless That's he was I'm in saying. Greece the whole time and just we just thought he was in, you know what I mean? Because he, I guess he was in Syria, Antioch, Syria for a long time too, right? Right. So that's that could make sense. I mean, it could. I, that I, he's I, not try to, I try to not be too dogmatic for not believing anymore. I try to see it from their perspective a little bit. Oh, me the too. Whole, the whole days and weeks after the cross thing, there's no way they, they he, I'm going to let have mess get away with that. No, 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 That's no. I'm with you. I try and, to, and I then try you to got, hear what everyone says too, just like you. And here's the biggest thing that I don't understand about all of this is we're talking about a guy who came back from the dead and they say 500 people witnessed it. Out of those 500 people, not one of them wrote down. I just saw this today. Oh my God, it was amazing. Yeah. Not one of them. We have 500 we have to witnesses. Wait. We have to wait 20 years. I'm giving them their 50, 50 AD. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them, yeah. them, I'm going to grant them that. 
when 49 we, 20... is like i think the earliest but anyway that's still okay let's say let's give, let's give them the earliest one 49 20 years later 500 people kept their mouth shut and yeah. didn't write a word yeah. well they the... were all uh they were all uh not able to write or read oh right. okay they yeah. would go to someone that could yeah Count, would... like if, if i just saw somebody come back from the dead right now I'm not, I'm going to write it down. I'm going to pull out my phone. I'm going to video it. Or go and tell something. more people to the point where they're going to write it down. It's not that, well, all we found were Paul's letters. So right. no one gave two flying, you know what's to write then, any of this down for like literally 40 to 50 years. And it was so big of a deal that right. no one knew how to read or write that bumped into this message. 500 that, people. That's a lot of people. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a lot of people. That it's such a hor the evidence is so horrible to assume that one writing, by the way, that says there were five hundred witnesses, first Corinthians fifteen. Right. That doesn't like that is not a and way then to argue. All the people that wrote stuff, like Philo and uh Pliny the Elder, and all these writers that wrote from thirty to fifty AD, they are they wrote like Pliny the Elder wrote an encyclopedia in the city of Caesarea, which is in Israel. He wrote a whole entire encyclopedia there and he was writing about like miraculous things that were out of the ordinary. Like, uh, like uh, he wrote about a girl turning into a guy and then he wrote about a prodigal birth. He wrote about people being deified. He wrote about the people in Qumran community. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you're telling me out of those 500 people, not one of their testimonies got to him to write it down. Yeah. What happened that to me, that was like one of the biggest things that I thought about. And use logic and say, okay, this, well, this, this one is one of the things that really goes back to the dating of Paul that makes me think that I don't have a problem with them being in the 50s is Paul's idea of their like this Torah, right? That it's not a letter, it's not the law on stone, it's this on the heart thing, right? Well, when you look at Philo, there's a lot of uh, scholars who've seen that Philo had opponents that were saying, all right, Philo you've allegorized the Torah and he does in his writings. He allegorizes the Torah and absolutely like even, um, by the way, we also see some form of this in Enoch because Enoch yeah. is saying stuff like, um, in the animal apocalypse, but also in other places where it's like, don't be the pig. Yeah. 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 Don't eat the pig. And he Good translates writing. it. He interprets this older Torah where he's like, it says, don't eat the pig. But what it means is, uh, don't be, don't, don't uh, mingle with the unclean or like it always has like a different meaning than what it says and they right. interpret it allegorically right. well these guys that are competing if you will sex of judaism with philo they say philo listen we don't need the torah anymore at all right. it's all spiritual right. it is not literal so if you have guys when Pi when we know philo's dealing with that in the 40s 30s 40s 50s how ridiculous is it to say paul's writing in the 50s and he's doing not the same exact thing, but some spinoff of some Hellenized, weird, stoic concept of Judaism. Right. Like, it's not implausible to me to say it's other reasons you would want to argue over 70 AD for. And that. plus, and this is, we, we forgot to mention this, the Jesus from the Talmud that got killed on Passover Eve for, for leading Israel astray. He had a mother named Mary who was an adulteress who never had who never had uh, intercourse with Joseph. The, the That's, there's, are you telling, so you got people like Bart Ehrman saying that this is a different Jesus from the first century BC. Yeah, you're talking about Alexander Janaeus. Yeah. Right. So, and he could be, and he's probably right. Okay. So maybe, maybe this whole, maybe they, maybe that really was the Jesus, but they allegorized him or something. Because the reason why I say that is because are you going to try to tell me that there's two different Jesus of Nazareth that were killed on Passover who had a mother named Mary that led Israel astray? It happened twice. That doesn't sound, that sounds insane to me. Yeah. So yeah, I'm thinking maybe, maybe they put him up. Maybe this, like, maybe he made such a big impact that a hundred years later that Paul is writing about that guy. Interesting. I, think, I mean, I don't know. I just throwing that out there, but there's a book called 70 by a guy named Michael. Um, Lawrence, I believe it is. I had him on my channel one time, but I never got to read his book. And someone else said that he thinks Paul in one of his epistles makes this statement that does not make any sense historically. It would make sense first century BC, but it wouldn't make sense AD. 
And he go. said, like scholars say, well, this is an issue here. And then like they try, they have an explanation for it. But Michael Lawrence, I think, is one of the guys who goes, actually, that place that Paul talks about that existed here, back here in the first century BC. Wow. So uh, he thinks Paul might be first century BC. I yeah. don't know. That would be insane. I mean, yeah. look, I don't, I, look, I, at the end of the day, the evidence is horrible. I had a. That's um, all you can really say is we don't, it's so yeah, bad. Yeah, I had a, a philosopher came on my channel, right? And um, it was, uh, uh, how come I can't think? I can't remember his name and it doesn't matter right now because honestly it's just a point yeah. he has a lot of historian friends in australia and uh graham oppie that was his name oh and, graham oppie yeah he's great yeah yeah and he said man i've got some really good history friends and he said um a lot of them don't do history in the first century though and, and i'm listening because because um our source material is so bad for like the the jesus -y thing yeah. that they don't really like to get into it but they just rest like with the rest of history historians and stuff and say yeah there was probably a guy uh named jesus this and this and that but the evidence is just not that great right. um yeah that's one of the things that his buddies were saying is they didn't like and they doesn't want to do it but am i the only one that thinks it's completely utterly insane that we have another jesus of nazareth from the first century bc that did all the same things and died in the same day well same. let's be careful not to say all the same things but according right. no, to you're, gospels, that's a good point. but if you're gonna say like but there's just three or four so really weird. clear things like he's from nazareth and or then, he's this he's that i need to look at this source myself I've and then why that. would the talmud bring him up if he wasn't a big deal he was just some some guy on passover we killed him i'm just gonna write that in there for no reason it's gotta yeah, be it's gotta be something big about that now i'm gonna be honest with everyone who's watching this i'm i still have to look into this Right. I'm just throwing that out there, but yeah, I don't even know because it sounds fishy for and, me. And to add to what you were saying about the first century, just like having no, it's so, it's so, it's such a black area. Because you, you go back before that, the time of Herodotus, the time of the time of uh, Xenophanes, they wrote in depth. I mean, there's yeah. sculptures of these people's faces. You can, you know, what Herodotus even looks like. Yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, the first century comes around. And it's like we're back in the year 30,000 BC. Like we lose yeah. everything. If you ever check out Richard Carrier's book about ancient science or science in the ancient Roman world, it's I really interesting. One. Oh, okay. Oh, so you have him on the history. Well, if I'm you taking get his, his other class book, because of you, get, actually. Get his other book on Audible. Salesman, you know, you're a salesman over there, dude. You got I'm me. Just, look, I'm man, not, you I'm, sold I'm, it to me, though. I was like, I do want to learn a little bit because I'm making this YouTube channel. I should know what I'm talking about. Dude, his and I feel like Richard is Carey is the guy that'll teach me. So, and I also signed up for uh, Dr. Price's course. Patreon. Who's Dr. Price? Okay, okay, awesome. Yeah, yeah, he writes some good articles there. Yeah. Um, I was gonna say in his book on ancient science, like if you listen to the to the detail that he talks about on ancient Greek science and how like they were dealing with intestines and and i'm like dude what, what do you have in the first century here's what you have right you ready for this you're gonna love this this is so much information you have philo <laughs> you have josephus that's it and then you might pliny, be pliny the elder Tacitus or Suetonius if you want to like yeah and pliny them. the elder right okay but there you're like oh my gosh and we've lost history like i can't remember one of the other jewish historians that was competing with josephus Right. as a historian that we we lost it all to history there's right. shit from tacitus it almost makes have. you wonder if that was the church deliberately trying I thought to destroy. the same thing yeah. i think the same thing but then again i don't want to just completely wholesale everything conspiracy you know right. richard carrier and other historians and other scholars will say like sometimes the church just let things rot because they didn't see it as important so the fact that we even know about kelsis really makes me go did they intentionally like ignore and say all right i want this to be destroyed or did they say at some point during history this papyri actually made it all the way to this time and we're like screw that i'd rather do herodotus or or i'm gonna right. copy aristotle or whatever yeah and they're not even worried about this other jewish historian plus it, it doesn't really favor their church so maybe they're uh, like yeah eh. No, you got to you got to look at it that way too and that's that's healthy i don't know which one's true right but exactly i agree with that but you know what? To add to what you're saying, though, um, if you go back before, like, for Democritus and Epicurus, I'm probably saying their names wrong, they were talking about atomic theory. 
in the 400s BC. Adams, I'm talking oh, yeah. about, yeah. I did not know this when I was a Christian. So all of a sudden they go from talking about atoms and theorizing about atoms and basically like uh, quantum science in the ancient world. I don't know if it's quite... No, no it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't what it is today. Yeah, but, yeah. But they were getting there is what I'm saying. They were working on science that honestly backtracked. And Richard Carrier makes the case in that that's book what, that I'm telling you about. That's, and that's what I'm saying. And all of a sudden the church comes around and they stop. Okay, Anything so it stops. wasn't just the church. I do want everyone to know something else happened too. It wasn't just Christianity. And yes, you're right though. Christianity and the pagans. So you'd be shocked to find out there were some nutty, ridiculous pagans too. Of course. Roman and, Imperial cult was nuts, man. But they, were, they, but they the had church to, they had was to, not... They had a slaughter of animal to get an omen before they went to war. Right, right. So it was but just as it was the same shit. These yeah. weren't the philosophers, though, that you, you you're reading about. These right. are different nutcase religious yeah, people pagans, who yeah. are like superstitious as hell. And yeah. early church fathers, uh, Richard Carrier points this out in his book as he goes through the history of the early church fathers. Most of them were anti-science. Not only were the Christians that way, there were a lot of pagans that were also anti. They weren't putting money into that. The, yes. the Roman church collapsed. They would when say that, that we're eating from the from the tree of knowledge of, of good and evil. It's, it's, we shouldn't do that. Yep. They're to like, move. screw all that. We don't need that. We have the Lord. And, it, right. and yeah, dude, you're right. It Slow was, down everything, I just, man. Until, I want people until to the know that. Yeah, until the Enlightenment era came around and atheism sort of kind of came back around. And all of a sudden we got computers and the internet and spaceships and shit. Like, well, the Muslims, you'd be shocked to find out there was a algebra. scientific revolution. Yeah. Algebra come from Islam. Yeah. But there was a scientific revolution, I think in the, uh, ninth, 10th century. Yeah. AD. And, and Timbuktu especially was a huge place for science. Like there's a lot of, uh, scientific. Then they, then they had a reformation, man. Yeah. And they went, <laughs> Poo poo science, and they were getting it from the Greeks. By the way, they didn't right. just come up with this stuff. They were finding the because you know they conquered the Roman Empire where yeah. all these archives were. Oh, yeah, Carthage. They're reading this stuff. That was Carthage. Yeah, it came yeah. From Timbuktu. Yep. So with them learning all that, and then they go back and say, "We need to get back to Allah and the true religion," and they had all the scientific revolutionary stuff went down the toilet. It's yeah. just crazy how that works. It is, dude. I just wanted to say that though, because I want people to know we're not just bashing the Christians, but they did play a significant role yeah. as to not the, the non-progression. And then the Christians will say, yeah, but we played a significant role in the progression of uh, enlightenment science. Look like you quoted one of these guys who is a fundamentalist, who's also a scientific revolutionary. Okay. Got it. But if yeah. you go back, who else, who else fought against round earth, the church, yeah, that's true. They would burn you at the stake for saying that the, the earth goes around the sun and not the other way around. They will say, well, don't make an argument. Christianity is the reason science didn't progress. And then we'll say, well, don't make an argument that Christianity is the reason science did progress. That's for right. sure. Um, yeah, th they'll try to make an argument both ways. But the fact is, it's not just a blame on the church. Right, that's true. Uh, Richard Carrier said the pagans and the church at the time were both. Yeah. And it went down the drain, bro. That's just the problem being fundamentalist, anything. Fundamentalist yeah. pagans were, were a thing, you know? Yeah. yeah, dude, there's so much. I, I'd like to look at the source though. You got me peaked because I know the Alexander Janaeus thing is a definite weird source that it's like, okay, strange an early, early church father doesn't even know when Jesus, how long Jesus lived, 50 years. It's right. what the hell is going on? How does, I think it's oh, just you know a I could be wrong. You know what else I noticed about the, the age of Jesus, they said he's died at 33 years old. But then you actually look at do the numbers. So Her Herod dies at 4 BC. And then they, he turned and he got baptized in like the 14th year of Tiberius, which was like 37, eight or something like that. 30, which would bring his death around 37 AD, which means he was like 40 years old when he died, not 33. And I, I thought that was, people don't talk. There's a lot of things that people don't talk about that are really easy to find. And right. one, of, one of them is the, the Jesus in the Talmud. I'm surprised there's not more people talking about that. Yeah. It's, just, it's a very strange thing. And I'm not saying I know that's... I think the reason is they look at it like they're looking at the Talmud as propaganda also against... That could be very true. That could and be it's later in this... You know how you mentioned, let's suppose I grant 
this Jesus is also a Jesus from Nazareth, is also a Jesus who gets put to death, who also supposedly something to do with three days or whatever, right? We grant all that. Are we supposed to take the Talmud at its face of supposing this is a historical document about an actual guy in the first century BC? Or is it more likely, and I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there, that they have this narrative already developed and running around as rumors. And let's say this other asshole in the first century they don't like. Yeah. So they say, well, we don't like this guy. We're going to make him look like Jesus because they didn't like Jesus either. Right. So now they you know say what? there's another Jesus. I don't know. You just, you just enlightened me right there because I've read a lot of the Talmud. And it's a very fascinating book to read. And there's a lot of allegories in there that aren't real history. Mm. Possibly this could be another one. And I just thought about that. I didn't even think about that. You said that. You just made a good point. This could be just an allegory. It could be just using Jesus of Nazareth at a different time New period. Testament. Right. Yeah. To jab, to jab at this other guy that they don't like. Yeah, because it also says that he's in he's he's uh in hell, in excrement, uh, boiling excrement. Oh yeah, that, what do you think's <laughs> going on? Yeah. So yeah, they that could be Jesus. all. They do blame Jesus in the Talmud for the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple, um, whereas the and you got to imagine why do they say that? Well, a lot of people who take that literal will go see that means Jesus existed around the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple and therefore he. Ex I get it. I understand why people would do that, but I wouldn't jump to that conclusion because I would also say, look at the New Testament and what it's done to Jewish people and how they're reviewed anti-Semitically from the pagans. Right. So now you have a document that literally blames the Jews for the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. The only thing they can do is blame back. So they go, well, no, 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 we didn't. We're not the blame. He's the blame. This guy in your own story is the one. So now it's just a... You know, he did it. No, he did it type bullshit. Right. And nobody really knows what the truth of the matter is because even the highly theological propaganda material we have from the New Testament, that can't even agree with itself. Yeah. So, man, there's no telling unless we get a time machine or we find some new documents we have never found. But it's fun to talk about. It, it is fun. I, you know, I just like to like, I want people to, to speculate like we just did. Right. And then I want them to hear guys like me who go, Hold on. It, what if it was this? Could it be that? Instead See how you just did that with me, though? It worked. Yeah. Uh, you just did that with me. You just pointed out something that I didn't even think about. Yeah. I'm thinking about this as real history, real Jewish history, that they wouldn't lie about this. And then you, you said, well, maybe and the, uh, maybe it is an allegory. You know what I mean? It could be. I'm not going to say it is. I need to look at it. But I just know that they definitely did not like um, Jesus. Right, they right. also were not big fans of Goyim. Uh, right. You know, they still didn't like the Gentiles. Well, you know who's really good about uh, showing how Christianity diametrically opposes Judaism is your boy, uh, Rabbi Tobias Singer. Oh, yeah. Tobias he, Singer. If you, if any Christian, like, gets into his videos, they're probably going to be deconvert. Like, he's the he's <laughs> he's good at that, dude. He knows how to show you that because they really are diametrically opposed in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, they are. I mean, it's something completely especially if you look at orthodox judaism and you compared it but i mean the new testament does some radical stuff like seriously radical yeah um yeah maybe I, maybe i'll hook you up with them and uh see if you oh you that'd be great that'd be awesome dude yeah yeah but listen man this has been amazing i'm glad i finally got to meet and um i'm gonna keep watching and uh i'll see you later man Hey, look, man, if you guys are just lost out in the world, you don't know where the hell you're going, it's okay. Just don't forget, we are Myth Vision.